voila, I love it when that technology yeah. works. <laughs> and if we're really working, there we go. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Welcome, thank you all for being here. We'll leave it there, that's a good place to start. So, imagine that you wake up in the morning, you wander out to the backyard. This happens in our, in our house, by the way. We'll, you know, we're, the first thing we do is we kind of go out and check on the chickens. And when I open the back door, they hear me coming. And all 21 of them, yes, we have 21. All 21 of them come running, right? Mm. Ah, the guy's got food for us. Okay, well, that's fine. But what I'm after is the eggs, right? <laughs> and so I go and harvest a few eggs. On the way back, the, you know, I grab some onions and some tomatoes. And I walk in make some breakfast. By the way, bottom left there, entire meal out of the yard. Mm. Happens often at the urban farm. Mm -hmm. It happens often. It's possible to do this. So then I also have an orange tree out back, so I grab some oranges and make some orange juice. Fresh squeezed. You know, that's the kind they sell for like $18 a, a glass at the, mm -hmm. you know, at the fine restaurants, right? And oh, don't forget, we got some people coming over today from the neighborhood. And I've designed the yard, I have this edible forest, I've designed this yard to feed the neighborhood. There's enough food there ongoingly, regeneratively, into the future, it just shows up. <laughs> the food just magically shows up in my yard. Imagine that. Well, this is possible. It's not a fantasy, it's reality. It's happening in my yard. How many urban farmers out there do I have that also do that? Yeah, look at that. Real high. That's maybe five, seven percent of the room, right? And ten years ago, actually ten years ago, I wish I. Uh, next time I'll have to add this picture. So I got a picture. They put me on the front of a magazine, right? And I'm sitting cross-legged in my front yard, and the sun's coming up over my head, and I have a nice dress shirt on. This was 2007, and the headline said, "Would you want to be neighbors with this guy?" Exclamation <laughs> point. Right? Well, you know, it was kind of tongue in cheek, but they were really poking fun at me. And this was just 10 years ago. Well, so can you imagine this for yourself? It's possible. We have 10 or 15 of you out there that are doing it. It just takes some planning. It's a process. It's a, we got to change the way we think. And we have to change the way we think. Yes, that is me. That is me. I had braces. It was 1975. Um, in 1970, I, I, to this day, I do not know how this happened. I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. It was in pencil on lined paper. How does a 15, 14, 15 year old know that? I don't know, but I knew. There was something up. There was something significantly wrong with how we're, how we're living on the planet. There we go. Then 1991 came around. 1991, it was, a, it was the year of my life that changed my life forever. There were multiple things that happened that all came together and collided into this, into this juicy space of, okay, Greg, you're going to be spending the rest of your life and probably your next lifetime working on food. So the first thing that happened is I read a book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Anybody know that? If you haven't read that book, go get it. I'm getting chills, and I read it 20, what, three years ago? It's a conversation between a gorilla and a man. And what he does is, Quinn, who wrote it, he, he designs this philosophy where he takes us through the last 10,000 years to how we got where we are today. It's pretty pungent how we've gotten here. There's been a lot of value in it, but he, 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 the way he writes about it is amazing. Go get the book. Second thing that happened, I discovered something called permaculture. People know what permaculture is? Yeah. That is so incredibly cool because 25 years ago when I started teaching permaculture here in town, nobody knew what it was. I like to call permaculture the art and science of working with nature. So how do we get in the flow and work in the flow of nature? I, that, so I discovered it. So when I actually found it, what happened for me was it was like, oh, wow, this is what I've been looking for. 
right? Top left. I used to, uh, one of my businesses along the way, this is, I've had, I don't know, 20 something businesses. Um, I used to own the can of gift factories in the malls here at Christmas time. You guys remember that from the early 80s? You used to take your Christmas gifts to the mall and they'd seal it in a can and you had to open the can opener, open it with a can opener. It was really cool. That was uh, around Thanksgiving time we were getting ready to set up. Um, and the one on the bottom right here, um, that was a picture that was actually taken in 1991. And we found it behind the stove about two years ago. It had fallen behind the stove. That is really how many carrots I harvested. My, mom, my mom's an artist, she painted that. The other thing that happened in 1991 is a friend of mine went on a sailing trip. And they, they went to this island and they were looking for a grocery store. That's what we do if we want food, right? We go to a grocery <laughs> store. And what happened was, is they, 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 you know, they went, stopped on the island, and the islanders said, well, here, go pick your own. Now, I'm 30 years old at this moment, and Walt is telling me this story. And I've done the permaculture design course. I've read Ishmael, and it's like, oh, mm. right. Go pick your own. Wow. I did a seminar was a two weekend seminar where I was supposed to define who I was in the world. I'm a lifelong learner, I love learning, I'm always in classes, I'm getting ready to sign up for another nine month class here in about two weeks. And so what came out of that for me was this, I am the person on the planet responsible for transforming how we raise our food. 1991. And I live that now every day, it's so incredibly cool. I like that quote. Yeah. Amen. We have to think differently. Requires a new way of thinking. So what I'm going to propose to you is today is Food System 3.0. Food System 3.0 is a combination of Food System 1.0. Food System 1.0 was what happened prior to 10,000 years ago, really. Natural systems. It was pretty much hunting and gathering. Hey, this is, you know, caveman days, right? Um, the benefits, it was truly sustainable, and I really, really, really don't like that word sustainable, because do you really just want to sustain a relationship? Nope. No. You want a thriving relationship, right? So, but it, it serves its purpose. So, it was a sustainable system. You know, it's kind of this circular thing, right? Produces healthy, nutrient-dense food. Drawbacks, it's generally thought that you can't produce enough food inside of this system in order to feed humanity. It's probably the case because there's, what, 8 billion or 7 billion people on the planet, so how do we feed them? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and it's subject to the system, uh, to, to systems and to seasons and to extremes. Um, you know, storm comes in, wipes out, you guys are, you know, not going to be eating. So we really don't want to go back to the cavemans, do we? No. So takeaways from food system 1.0. It's regenerative by nature. So regenerative. Think this. All right. It's regenerative by nature. Circular. So everything gets used. Okay. There's no waste in this system. That's a really big thing. That, in my opinion, is the thing that we need to fix in our current system, is end waste. The only usable resources that are created in this thing, are, or the only resources that are created in this thing are something that you can use. You can eat, you can, right? And it works on the energetic flow of nature. Again, I keep doing this, because this is, this is, an, this is the, your paradigm shift for today, right here. If you don't take anything else away, go from this, which we're going to talk about in a minute, to this. Okay? Food system 2.0. What we call modern agriculture. Now, I'm not going to bash modern agriculture. There's a lot of values. We've got some takeaways we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, but I was thinking over the past week for the benefits. And one might think a benefit would be that we're feeding seven million people on the planet, right? And I guess that could be a benefit. 
seven billion? Something like that. That, that, that could be a benefit. I, I suspect it, it is because it's gotten us here. However, the food is highly suspect, in my opinion. The food is highly suspect. Drawbacks. It's based on this linear, linear economy. So it's based on this thought. You know, it's uh, take, make, dispose, that thought process. Notice that there's waste and an end on this. So it ends. There's an end here. And when you stop to think about it, every single resource that we've created as human beings is set up on this. That chair you're sitting on is going to end up in a landfill one day. The carpet, the walls, everything. Everything that we've created on the planet is set up this way. There's a lot of waste involved, a lot of pollution. Pollution in permaculture, pollution is waste. So we kind of put them together, but we as a culture think of them separately, I think, a little bit. So I just wanted to call them both out. Causes pollution, creates nutrient-dense food. We're paying attention. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. It's a mono, so this whole notion, of, we just found out the past couple of weeks that the monoculture process, they've actually pinned it on the crash of the bees. Did you know that? Yeah, they pinned that on the monoculture culture process. Well, so here's the thing for me, it's like, duh. It makes perfect sense because when you look at a healthy natural system, the way it works, if you take it, take it and do this to it, it's gonna crash. It's, gonna, it's not gonna work, so that makes perfect sense. This is exceed, exceeds the carrying capacity. This is a really important concept, carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the capacity of an ecosystem to carry the biological load that's in it. So simply put, you have a fish pond, and you have algae in that fish pond, and you have snails in that fish pond, and you have fish in that fish pond, and there's this balance that happens, right? Okay. So then we come along as human beings, we gotta feed the fish. Okay, so we start feeding the fish, what happens? You get more fish, exactly, you get more fish. And then what else do you get? More waste. More waste. Okay, well, that's fine because the, the snails and the, and the um, algae take, on, take that on, right? But, right, exactly. It gets to a point where it crashes. Um, that is carrying capacity in a nutshell. It's a very important concept in us moving our culture forward. So let's talk about some of the takeaways with Food System 2.0 because it has been valuable. Okay? Technology and systems. We have created some absolutely incredible technology around all of this. One of my favorite toys right now is called a tower garden. Anybody have a tower garden? They are so cool. They're a puddle, of, you know, a bucket of water on the ground, and there's a tube that runs right up, and it's like a Christmas tree. You plant the plants in the side, you put nutrients in the bottom, there's no soil in it, and it just circulates hydroponically, the water, and waters the plants, and you grow plants out of it. And when it's fully grown out, you have a Christmas tree to eat. It's really cool. We ought to, Heidi, where are you at? We ought to use that for Christmas. Yeah. So we have all of these technologies that can be the foundation for Food System 3.0. It's like, let's take that and use it. So one of the huge things, so I was talking to my friend Miguel, you're gonna see one of his uh, graphics here in a minute. I was talking to my friend Miguel this week, and I said, okay, Miguel, Benefits of the of Food System 2.0. He said, Greg, we learned how to feed a lot of people. There's some value there. Plus, we have this absolutely incredible food system in this country that is set up to feed, deliver and feed 330 million people in this country. Without it, we would be toast. So I don't see it going away anytime soon. What I see it is getting healthier. I see that when I show you Food System 3.0 here in a minute, I see that we're gonna be able to create and plug into Food System 2.0 and transform it. And that's really what I'm talking about. Let's transform it. Um, hey, we learned a lot about what not to do, right? And it's taken so long and so, used so many valuable resources. We need to stand back and appreciate it. So Food System 3.0, this is 
they call it a circular economy. It's bit, Cradle to Cradle is a book that's been written. Um, it's about this. And it's about this in a very complex way. In fact, Michael is in the back of the room. He's going to be talking next. He's going to be talking about how he plugged a lot of these kinds of things, what I'm about ready to share it with you now, how he plugged them in in southern Arizona. So, so that we're actually making this stuff real. It's based on, the, on a fusion of natural, nature systems and modern technology. There's benefits. There's no waste. Everything is connected. It's cooperative in nature. Everybody wins in this system. Our politicians, I'm sorry if we have any politicians out there, our politicians could learn a lot from cooperating. <laughs> right? I, I can't even watch the news anymore because it makes me so sick to my stomach on how much they're fighting. It's like, come on guys, we're not going anywhere with that. We've got to cooperate. And that's what I love about this system. Everybody's boat floats higher when we're creating a system like this. It's a destination. It's not a destination, it's a journey. So I get this all the time. People say, oh, you live in that completely sustainable house in North Phoenix. It's like, well, I don't live in a cave and I drive a car and I wear clothes. So I don't know about completely sustainable. It's a process. It's a, it's just do it. Go out and play with it and have fun with it and learn what you learn along the way. It's self-sustaining and it fuels innovation. Drawbacks. So some may think that a drawback is that it's labor intensive. Well, imagine that. What if we put a food system in place that was labor intensive? We'd put people to work, right? So some of the possibilities here of the Food System 3.0. It's smaller scale. It's regenerative in nature. It spreads a food system that is decentralized. And it's a more stable model. The problem with our Food System 2.0 right now, it's very unstable. You know, if trucks stopped running, if the power goes out, if we have a storm, we have about three days worth of food in the grocery stores. That's it. That's a problem. That is a problem. Now, I'm not talking about end of the world stuff. I'm talking, you know, we have a storm that runs through. San Diego, in fact, Scott Murray, who you're going to be hearing from later on this afternoon, and I think it was 2011, he lives in San Diego. They had a power outage for what? How long was it for? It was a four-day power outage. I mean, and when you think, of, I had a power outage at the house at the urban farm recently. Nothing works. <laughs> Nothing works. Our technology doesn't work, our, you know, our stove didn't work. It's like, whoa, that is an eye opener. That is an eye opener. So what this does is this builds a food system that is decentralized and it's a lot more stable. And it, here's the other cool thing. It spreads the wealth and it provides a lot more profits for more people. So I have three slides here and I just want to kind of point in the direction that we're going with this. This is a model that was developed by a friend of mine. At the top, it says grow. Um, at the bottom, it says, bottom left, it says waste. So what Miguel was doing, they were harvesting the food waste. They were liquefying it. They were feeding it to worms. By the way, they call it worm wine. And for those of you that know about worm castings, the worm castings are like the best of the best, right? It's like gardener's gold for us, right? So they're growing, drip irrigating this stuff into worm beds where they're growing food at the same time. So the worms are processing this stuff. They're growing food out of the top. They're harvesting the food. They're supplying it back to the same place where the waste came from. It's like, whoa, that's right. That's, that's a start. That's a great place to start. Here's another one. Plant Chicago. Anybody heard of Plant Chicago? I will send you all, help me remember this, Kari, would you? I will send you all a video. It's a one and a half minute video from Plant Chicago, and it talks about this entire system that they have set up. This was done in an old meat packing plant in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and so in 1991, another thing that happened for me was I designed what I called a completely sustainable fish farm because it didn't make sense to me that they were harvesting the fish and throwing everything else away and keeping the meat. I wanted to put everything else in, you know, I wanted to put everything in play. Again, do this. So this is what they've done here. They've got a commercial kitchen in place. Um, they've got a brewery. Uh, they've got an anaerobic digester that's actually making 
uh, electricity to help run the space. They've got plants. They've got fish. It's an amazing thing that they're doing in an old warehouse. So this food system 3.0, I'm not making up anything new here. I'm just kind of packaging it and saying, looky, right? How cool is that? Then I always got to call out my friend Jen. Jen and I were in uh, uh, graduate school at the same time. I went back to ASU late in life. I was there from 1999, I got my bachelor's, to 2006 when I got my master's. And Jen and I were there in 04 and 05 together. Jen is the one on the right there. Anybody know Gotham Greens? Gotham Greens, they put greenhouses on the top of office buildings in New York City. They have almost, I talked to her the other day, they have almost 100,000 square feet of greenhouses on office buildings. In fact, they put, our Whole Foods people still here? They put, a, they put a greenhouse on the top of a Whole Foods in the Bronx, New York. 20,000 square foot greenhouse. Now that, is cool. They're growing it up top and they're taking it down below and you take it home and eat it. These are the kinds of things that I'm talking about in Food System 3.0. So here's a really quick look at a poss one possible model on what, that you can plug into. So what we need to do is we need to transition to a local economy. A local economy is where we source it, buy it, find it, use it, all 100% in this area. Now, really, I mean, we're not gonna buy cars here, we're not gonna buy cell phones, so is this possible? Probably not, but I just planted a seed for you guys to start thinking that it is. Because there's so, we could do our food this way. We could get all of our food here. All of our food, we could derive it from, you know, the Phoenix metropolitan area. Local economies, they build resiliency and in infrastructure. Resiliency is like a rubber band, so, when you stretch out a rubber band and let it go, it pops back, right? That's resilient. When you stretch out a rubber band and it's old and cracked and it snaps, that's not. Local economies are more resilient. In fact, you know this, this farmer's market here, right here, okay? Voted one of the top 50 farmer's market in the country by Cooking Light Magazine just three months ago. Wow. Yay for them. I know, yeah. pretty cool, right? Yes, absolutely. And three weeks ago, we started um, I kind of got tagged to help with this. Kari and I got tagged to help with it. Three weeks ago, we started um, the grower's market here. So there's a farmer's market. You go buy food, right? Well, at a grower's market, what do you buy? Plants and seeds and soil and fertilizer and advice. And they're gonna be, there's going to be classes here every weekend on you know, how to grow. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And so the cool thing is, Bo did it. Bo created this. This is Bo's creation. And we're just kind of, you know, adding fuel to the file. We, we all did it together, but she's taking it on and running with it. So that's how, you know, that builds the resilience, the infrastructure. That builds community. We purposely started this thing at 8 with Whole Foods so that we could get you guys early, here early, and start talking with each other. How many people have met somebody new so far today? Okay, we can go home now. <laughs> and most of all, it grows our uh, food you know, our food systems and economy here. That is the important thing. Okay, so, yes? Um, what is a food economy? Let's just, I'm gonna very quickly do this. A food economy is the whole food process, not whole foods that way, the whole food process, right? It's growing, harvesting, distributing, preparing, eating, and then disposing of again. This first, one, two, three, four, five, down to eating, that's a very linear concept. Okay? When we tag on disposal, that makes it into this. You know, we don't have enough uh, food scraps at our house for our chickens and for our soldier flies. I grow soldier flies, soldier flies, those are cool. And I don't have enough food scraps. Um, so if anybody wants to bring us your food scraps, I'd take them. <laughs> anyway, so that's the low, that's the, this is what a food economy is. And so what I'm gonna propose is something called the local food economy model, or the LFE. This is something that Miguel, my friend Miguel Jardine and I created. It's an open source model. Open source means anybody can use it. Nobody can own it all. And there's seven parts to the local, to the local food economy model. Education, farming methods, collection and distribution, that's a huge one. Local seeds, thanks Bill and Bell. 
creating farmers and community, value-added products, and culture. So let's just talk real quickly. Education, why is it first? That's <laughs> what I do. Um, we recently launched, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. We recently launched about 10 months ago, Urban Farmer U. Anybody taken one of our classes yet? Thank you. Um, we have free classes every month. We have paid courses every month that we're launching. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna talk about that in a little while. Um, you know, take a class, learn. Go, the, do, go to the Master Farmer program. Kari, where's Kari? You want to talk about the Master Farmer program? Go talk to Kari. It's a great program through the um, Cooperative Extension. Um, but take a class. And then start teaching it in your living room or at your yoga studio. Here's the thing. How many people know something well enough that they could come up to the front of the room and talk for five minutes? Right? Most everybody. That's what I started doing with fruit trees 16 years ago. Literally, I started talking about them in my front living room. I'd invite people over and we'd sit around in a big circle and I'd share with them what I knew about fruit trees. If you want to teach about gardening, I know that they need gardener, gardening teachers here. See me or see Kari and we'll get you hooked up with Bo um, because they've hired a teacher coordinator for here. The best way to learn something is to to teach it. That's right. Go teach it. So the possible, you know, I'm standing in a local restaurant. I have my Lucy's cup, right? I carry my Lucy's cup almost everywhere. But I wasn't at Lucy's. And this guy's standing there looking at me like this. Looked at me, looked at my Lucy's cup, looked at, right? He said, what are you doing? He was curious. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't. Out, lashing out at me. He was, he was just really curious. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I bring my cup so that they don't have to give me a cup that I take home and throw away or recycle. Bing! Right? Light went on for him. This was about a 30-second interaction. He said to me, oh, I need to start doing that. And he was sincere. That's teaching. If you just show up, and be great in the world, that stuff happens. <laughs> farming methods. So there's all kinds of farming methods. If you want to be a farmer, um, there's organic, polyculture, culture, permaculture. Say hi to Chad over here. Hi, Chad. He's going to be talking fish-powered garden here in a little while. Amazing. I love that idea. They're, you know, basically, that's one of these. right? They're taking the fish poop and watering plants with it and fertilizing plants with it. Um, if you haven't checked out gardenpool.org, go check it out. Perhaps one of the coolest things going on in the state around this regenerative design stuff. Tower gardens, I talked about that. The possibilities are endless. Collection and distribution, this is a hard one. This usually takes a lot of infrastructure to make it happen. One of the uh, people that are doing it really well, or companies, is Chow Locally. Anybody get a Chow box? Check out chowlocally.com. Really, really, really great organization. They're not growing it. What they're doing is they're coordinating with farmers okay, and getting it for farmers and then distributing boxes. Uh, it's a weekly box. There's CSAs. There's truck farming. There's food co-ops. What I want you to be thinking about when you're thinking about this is, OK, where can I, what can I contribute? Because let me tell you, there are jobs in every step of this way. There's things that you can do to go out and make a living in every step of this piece. It's really cool. And I've done well. I did truck farming. While I was at ASU, what I did every Wednesday morning is I'd get up really early. I'd harvest all of the food that I had available in my front and backyard, and I would take it to town and country farmer's market. I did that for three years while I was in school, and I regularly left. Shh, don't tell the IRS. I regularly left with two to $400 cash in my pocket. for you know, 15 hours worth of work while I was at ASU. It's easy. In fact, that is a perfect model. If you are a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, that is an absolutely perfect model for you. You make a few hundred bucks extra a week and, right? Seeds. Seeds, here's the thing. We don't have seeds. We don't have nothing. 
Bill's going to be talking to us a little later on today about seeds and the importance of seeds. The, the, really, the future of food is seeds. Right? Was anybody at the um, uh, Great American Seed Up? A few of you? So here's the thing. We use this room right here, and we put uh, 47 different varieties of seeds in 47 different buckets. And we put a little card out there that said what it was, you know, what the seed was. And you could go, you could, went and scooped up. So for 75 cents or a dollar and a quarter or $2 per scoop, you got about 15 packets of seeds. It was an absolutely amazing event. Anybody got your, your ticket for the next one? Yes. Hey, great. So tickets are five bucks. It's going to be in this room. It, it is October 31st. Was that your question? The Great American Seed Up. You can find, about it at, find out about it at growphx.com. Bill and Bell and Kari and I are, this is one of our projects. And I think we have some, somewhere closer to 70 different varieties of seeds this year. Oh yeah, there's information. There's, thank you, there's information in your bag about that. I've said enough about seeds. Creating farmers. My personal project is 10,000 urban farms in Phoenix. And that came out of, I was over with Scott, and I got to see Scott, he's in San Diego. You're gonna hear from him later today. I see him once or twice a year. I go over there and I just spend time with him and we talk. And it, whatever got planted on one trip on my way back, it was like, wow, what if, remember that? What if there was an urban farm on every street? That should be easy, right? Just an urban farm on every street that would grow food for the people on that street. How cool is that? Why not? Farmers markets, schools, thank you Whole Foods for you know, the work they do around school gardens. Woo! Thank them again, yes. And that value added products, this is you know, honey, this is uh, baby food, soaps, essential oils. If you wanna know how to make essential oils, talk to Chad, he knows all about it. Um, but this is, this is part of where you can actually increase the value of what you're growing. And then there's culture. Um, Miguel and I developed this model about five years ago and we were sitting in a room and he said, Greg, somebody came to me recently. This culture part wasn't part of it yet. Somebody came to me recently and he was, he's a counselor and he wanted to um, counsel his people and teach them how to grow food so that they could go out and get in their garden and grow healthy food and live a healthier life. And we didn't know where to put that in our model. And then we realized, that, well, there's policy, and you know, so there's all art. How many of you have gone to a restaurant, and they bring out this plate of food, and it's like, there is no way I'm gonna eat that, <laughs> right? It's art, it's art. So that, that's kind of where it, it falls in this space. So here's the deal, tag your it. If this is gonna happen, it's up to you, it's up to us. So, quick quiz for you. How many people are already growing food? Great, leave that arm up. How many people share it, other arm, with somebody else? Great, y'all are urban farmers. <laughs> Get over it. How many urban, named urban farms do I have out there? Fantastic, that's another really important piece to this. Y'all know the urban farm, right? because 20 years ago I decided to call it the urban farm and put it out there. There's two fat cats at apartment garden. There's Jack's Beanstalk. Did somebody register a name? No, just start calling it. <laughs> just start calling it, man. I mean, you can register a name. The urban farm is registered with the state. Okay. So you can absolutely register the name, but just start calling it and then tell people, I'm an urban farmer. And my farm name is Wish We Had Acres. <laughs> I know, isn't that great? Did you see how it lightened up the space? Right? And it starts creating a legacy. Mm -hmm. So claim that for yourself. Yeah. Start growing food and sharing it. Plug into the LFE, local food economy. Do something. Do something. So I want to take just a couple of minutes. So I do a... Uh, a year ago, I'm gonna go someplace else with that. A year ago, actually a year and a half ago, it was like, all right, now I'm gonna figure out how to get this stuff online. 
Actually, this conversation started with Bill and Bell and Toby Hemingway five years ago in December, almost six years ago. It's like, how do we touch more people with our content? How do we get more people in a room? Because on a really, really, this is an extraordinary day for me to have this many people in front of me. On a really good day, I have maybe 12 or 15 people. I want to make a different, bigger difference than that. There's more to be done. So a year and a half ago, I met this woman named Julia Zaslow. She's out of Northern California. And for the very inexpensive price of $4,500, in nine weeks, she would, she would tell me, walk me through a process of how to put my classes online. I paid her $4,500. And you know what? I got $4,500 worth of value in 24 hours. All I needed to know was what was the process. And she had it all laid out. Well, we finished the nine weeks. But I got everything I needed, and it was worth, don't tell her this, but it was worth 10 times that. Because it got the job done. On October 2nd of last year, I had over 2,100 people registered for an online webinar that I gave. And I had over 500 attend live. That was a free webinar, of which we do multiple ones a month. So if you would just very quickly, I want to just talk about this. I want to take two minutes and talk about this. This is the white sheet in there. This is the, um, these are the different classes that we offer, and we have some books in the back of the room. Um, all of our classes are online. Um, all of them, I am deeply dedicated that you get your life out of them. If you take the seed school online, you are going to know seeds, right, Bill? You are going to know seeds. If you take the aquaponics class, Chad, they're going to know aquaponics, right? So how they're designed, they're, e they're either four or seven weeks. And there's a, a specific time each week that we meet online. You just d pull up a website. And we, te we teach. You ask questions. It's very interactive. There's a... Um, there's a web page set up so that you have a, you know, your, your, all your, cust all your uh, membership stuff is in there. So the PowerPoints. Um, you, and once your account is set up, your account is set up, you can uh, go back and watch the videos because we record everything. Um, we're having really good luck with touching a lot of people with these things. So I really encourage you to take a, one of our free classes. Um, you know, if you want to dig in deeper, jump into taking a, one of our courses. Um, there is one on here, if you go to the bottom line, I just want to talk about that real quick. 2015 Fall Summit Package. So what we did um, is we packaged all of these together. And if you want to take them all, you can take them over the course of the next year. If you want to take them all, we put together a special price for you. Um, it's available. I can talk to you about it. Kari can talk to you about it. Chad can talk about his class. Bill and Bill can talk about Seed School Online. Um, if you have questions, please let us know. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you listening. <laughs>